So some time ago I made a video experimenting with the data retention of hard drives and I basically tried various methods of removing data from them to see just what it took to make sure your data is completely gone and safely removed or overwritten. But even before doing that I got interested in also performing some tests on SSDs since I've seen so many discussions on them in the comment section of my videos. The main thing people would usually argue about was the superiority or inferiority of SSDs as compared to hard drives, mainly due to the fact that the SSD sometimes comes soldered down to the boards of notebook motherboards and other consolidated devices, such as phones, tablets and other things using various types of solid state storage. And I for one think that no matter how reliable something is, having no option to swap out your storage other than going through a very complicated and expensive desoldering procedure is downright stupid because components fail, sometimes due to age, wear or some other part failing and being left without the ability to retrieve your precious data is just unnecessary. But then there are people saying that these are like indestructible or I guess immune to failing or that in case of like a Mac they will outlive the machine they're installed in. And even if that's the case I see no reason for them to be soldered down unless it's like a phone where every fraction of a millimeter counts and the whole system and storage management is designed differently. In any case it was about time to conduct some experiments of my own to try and tackle this question of SSD durability and to help us find out the answers to some questions about SSDs good folks from Orico again agreed to step in and help me out with this video. In particular since we'll be reading some drives in this video they've sent in their awesome mini tower docking station designed to do well all sorts of things really. You can use it as a RAID array box and stick up to two full size SATA hard drives or SSDs or you can use it as a dock since it gives you four additional USB slots as well as a couple of SD card slots. There's also a spot for M.2 sized SSD and it comes with a little heatsink which not only conducts that heat away from the drive but also transfers it to the outer aluminum housing. Yep, this thing is all aluminum and as I've said it's not just for show, it actually does a great job drawing heat away from other components. It also looks awesome if you have like the latest Mac mini and while I don't have that you can also see that it looks awesome with the solder one here. It also blends right in if you have any other silver or aluminum hardware like me and yeah I am a bit of an Oracle fanboy <laughs> and it fits right in with their other lines of hardware as you can see. So if you like this thing and you'd like to support me head on to the link in my description and get yourself this awesome looking box. So before getting into the actual experiments there are a couple of things we have got to get out of the way. First, there's just no way to find a definitive answer to the question of what kills your solid state drives because I just can't test every single one. There are just so many different variants like old SATA 1, 2, 3, M SATA, NVMe drives and so on, not to mention all the different brands and manufacturers. And what's more, pretty much every computer is going to have its own custom SSD controllers as well as things like power protection circuitry and there's no way I can test every single one of those. That being said I will sacrifice at least one of my drives to try and at least approach this puzzle and to see what does it take to kill or even more interestingly inhibit the functionality of solid state drives using several different methods. And we'll start with heat, <laughs> since the inside of your computer produces a lot of it and the SSD itself does emit heat as well, although compared to something like a CPU or a GPU it really doesn't get that hot and the SSD I have in my rig hangs around 26 degrees Celsius. According to most sources temperatures below 70 degrees Celsius are usually considered safe. But what if for some reason these got higher, for example if the drive is installed near the GPU or a component failure leads to thermal overflow. Well let's do some experiments. Before frying this thing though I'll use the black magic design disk speed test to determine somewhat of a baseline for this particular SSD which really isn't state of the art or anything, just the cheap one I had lying around and one thing with cheaper SSDs is of course the size of their cache so as this thing gets filled up it gradually slows down as this one is indeed doing. These tests are done by continuously reading and writing chunks of data, in this case 5 gigabytes, and recording the time it takes and yeah while well, the read times were fairly constant at around 450 megabytes per second, the write times would fluctuate as the cache filled up 
going between like 40 megabytes per second to 700 megabytes a second. I also timed how long it took to copy a 10.7 gig video file to it and it took 1 minute and 46 seconds. It's interesting since it was initially quite fast, the operating system had told me it would take under a minute, but once the cache gets filled up, the speed drops and the performance tanks. Also, since we were about to blast this thing with some heat, I could indeed tell that the thing was getting warm. And man, that sticker is for sure not helping with the heat dissipation, so I'll peel it off. Interestingly, once I got the sticker out, I could see that this thing only uses two NAN flash chips, so 64 gig each, and also has a tiny controller, as well as being just one-sided. Compare that to this Samsung SSD with a separate cache chip, nice big controller and 8 separate flash chips on both sides. Anyway, not that that has much to do with this experiment, but I just found it interesting. Right, so it was time to remove it from the dock and to see just how it responds to not just being stressed by data, but also by heat. I'll use my hot air station to slowly and carefully raise the temperature of this SSD. It's important to keep the temperature below 180 degrees Celsius, since that's when your typical solder melts, and I don't really want to go that far, so I keep it between 110 and 130, just as a base point. I focus the heat on the NAND flash chips as well as the controller itself, since that's what gets the most work done in this package and subsequently is what in fact gets the oddest during intense use. Once I made sure the heat was evenly distributed across the components, I popped it in my little dock and tried reading the data. But of course this was kinda dumb, since those little plastic and silicon chips really don't retain heat that well, so it got cooled off pretty quickly. So instead of doing that, I've tried heating it up while it was in the enclosure, and the results were quite a bit more interesting. I'll just focus on the read speeds, since the write speeds were all over the show, but once I got enough heat applied, the read speed started drastically dropping, like almost by half. And once I've stopped applying the heat and it all had time to cool down, it got back to reading at its full speed, which was still horrible, but you know, what you gonna do? <laughs> And this was totally expected, it's what we've all been told, but there's something about witnessing facts on your own versus just trusting the data you find online. And of course, if you were to go in higher with attempts, you could theoretically get it high enough to where you start actually melting the solder holding the components onto the board, but I don't think that's happening in your computer case unless it's on fire or something. Next, I was interested in how the opposite of fire works, in particular water or other liquids. And one nice thing about solid state drives, unlike spinning hard drives, is that they of course have no moving parts and the parts that do store data are far less sensitive to physical damage. When we did tests on that hard drive, we found that pretty much just opening the dry up was enough to compromise the data and letting it sit in water like this would surely just mess it up beyond saving. And even though pretty much all hard drives have a rubber gasket to prevent dust and moisture ingress, if that seal is damaged, you can say goodbye to your data. Not to mention they usually also have a tiny hole for pressure regulation, which is crucial due to the way they work internally. However, submerging an SSD in water and then cleaning it with alcohol afterwards and letting it dry had pretty much no effects on its functionality. I've even tried sticking it in some other liquids, including coke and beer, but upon washing them in some distilled water and later alcohol, drying them out, the dry went on to work just fine. Granted, there's always a way of letting some water or other liquid stay on the board, which in turn can corrode away the traces, or worse yet, cause a direct short between the pins. And yeah, me sticking the drive in some water and then installing it back in the case after it was clean and dry really isn't a good simulation for liquid damage, since what usually happens is a spill while the computer is on, and that can cause all sorts of internal issues, and I guess if you're unfortunate enough, it can even lead to a short in your drive. Now, I didn't want to stick a wet SSD into my computers or dogs because I really didn't want to damage my devices, but again, it all very much depends on the backup protection circuitry, and it's all kinda hit and miss, but what I am going to do is try simulating a short using an external device. Most SSDs, be it a 2.5 inch SATA drive or an M.2 SSD, rely on somewhere between 3 and 5 volts delivered to correct inputs on the power portion of the pins. Some of these are grounds though, and if there's a drop of conductive liquid in between, or if there's a component failure somewhere else on the computer's motherboard, current can be delivered to wrong places. 
We'll come back to that issue later because I have a feeling that might actually be the most destructive thing. So before doing all that, let's conduct a couple of other tests. <laughs> I'll drop this SSD 10 times from a height of an approximately 1 meter or like 3 feet onto a hard surface, which is something that can very well cause damage to a traditional hard drive, since the heads can misalign or other components can break off and potentially scratch the platters. Doing this kind of thing to an SSD really isn't recommended, but apart from soldered components getting broken off, I can't see how it would affect it. And not surprisingly, once I popped it in, it read just fine, and it didn't affect the read-write speeds in any measurable way. I've also heard that the SSD performance really drops once you start running out of space due to the inherent nature of how SSDs actually store that data across the NAND chips, and that's actually something I wanted to test out. I filled this dry up, and at this point it has less than 10% of its original capacity free. I will now try copying the same 10.7 gig file I've tried initially, and it indeed struggled more, taking around double the initial time. It went from 1 minute 46 seconds to around 3 minutes. After doing the speed tests, it also showed signs of degradation, with both read and write speeds growing to an absolute halt. And now with that out of the way, we can finally get to those short circuit tests I was so curious about. And we'll do them in succession, starting with something that could be likely if you, for example, somehow manage to connect the device backwards. I have here a couple of batteries producing around 3 volts, which is an operating voltage for most M.2 SSDs. So nothing spectacular, but what happens if that gets connected to the wrong place? Well, let's find out. I've hooked it up to a couple of alligator clips and to my multimeter probe so they can monitor the voltage drop and you can see it dropping here when I connect two grounds together. However, upon retesting the drive I could see no drastic changes, it read and wrote just fine and also it retained all the data so it didn't inflict enough damage to it or the protection circuitry it had had done its job absorbing it. But I mean, two AA batteries are only able to produce small amounts of current and it's very possible we just didn't have enough juice to zap this thing properly, so it's time to up the challenge, so to say, and hook up something a bit more powerful. So these wires lead to an external power supply and unlike our batteries, this one produces 24 volts at 1 amp. And while that's much more than your drive should typically expect, it's really not out of the ordinary for a modern device. For example, most USB-C power delivery supplies can do between 5 and 48 volts for like an extended power range. Not to mention that in a catastrophic case of a surge, you can experience all sorts of power fluctuations. So let's see what kind of a result we get with this when we induce a short circuit. And thank heavens we can finally see some sparks happening. Ooh. <laughs> now we're making sparks. <laughs> I was half afraid nothing interesting will happen in this video, but yeah, you can clearly see the scorch marks on the ground pins. I had serious doubts that this has any chance of chooching ever again, but I popped it into my reader and the damn thing lit up and read just fine to my absolute amazement. <laughs> Yeah, it still turns on, man. Oh, look, popped up. Yeah, still have all the data. But I kept at it, and after a bit of hunting and pecking with those probes, I managed to pop one of the components and do something even better than sparks. Smoke. Oh, oh let the magic smoke out. <laughs> Oh. oh, that's stinky. Woo. Inspecting this thing in some more detail, I couldn't really tell at this point whether it was a capacitor or a diode or maybe a resistor, but whatever it was, it blew. And after testing the drive again, surprisingly, it initially lit up, but then it would turn off again and I couldn't see it in any of my utilities. Since I could actually see at least one of the damaged components, I thought we could just try and botch this connection since it was clearly just a passive component of some sort. So I just quickly and shoddily breached that connection just to see if it would give me a result, but unfortunately, no luck. 
Now, this could very well be repairable. Maybe there's another component that blew internally and I just can't see it. Perhaps there's a trace that was broken that needs to be patched. And we've all seen those magicians who take the flash chips off of busted boards and are still able to retrieve data off of them, which, I mean, that's like black magic right there. But in some cases like this, the NAND chips themselves are affected by the power surge, so they too might be wiped or irreparable. Bottom line, what have I learned from messing around these past couple of days? Well, I'd say SSDs are actually really robust and resilient to physical damage, especially in comparison to something like an HDD, but they are certainly not indestructible. Heck, we haven't even tested all the factors like storing data for a long time while unpowered, which is also a known flaw with solid state devices and something that hard drives actually do better with, but those kinds of tests are a bit out of scope for this video. In any case, I'd say no matter how reliable solid state drives might be, I am in no way an advocate for having them soldered down and being unable to remove or replace them easily, which is unfortunately the case with many devices, from phones to notebooks. And while there's really no way around that practice in some cases, in many scenarios it's an unnecessary risk and I'd hate to be stranded with a zapped SSD with a power surge or something, since it would essentially turn my device into a paperweight. So yeah, that's pretty much all I have for you. Hope you enjoyed doing these experiments with me and if you by chance had an SSD failure, tell us in the comments what caused it and what were the results. If you liked this video, you might want to check out some of my other ones. I do videos like this every week. Reviews, restorations, repairs, retrospectives and all sorts of nerdy tech stuff. If you like what I do and want to support me, you can do so on Patreon for just one buck a month or more if you'd like. You'll get early access to my videos and I usually have a couple of there for my patrons to see first. If you'd like to chat with me and other users, you can join our Discord server. All the links will be in the video description. Thanks and I'll see you again soon. Cheers!